paint and look, it's Bible based, it's just that it's modern and it's in English we understand and no we don't have incense and communion but it's, it's, it's you know, just Christianity. There is a belief that, that someone who suddenly becomes very religious is having some kind of mental breakdown. Yeah, I think so and the thing is I just suddenly realised everything is like smoke and mirrors, everything's back to front and I think I did lose my mind but I was losing an unhealthy mind and gaining a good one and I was having my brain thoroughly washed because I suddenly could see things in the correct perspective. When you hear Sunita say that she needed to lose her mind and have her brain washed, you can understand why Simon Cowell was worried. But Sunita's decision to remake herself as a child of God has undoubtedly brought her happiness. Modern secular society, however, is uncomfortable with behaviour based not on hard fact, but blind faith. What was interesting, though, in the sermon that we were listening to earlier is one of the things that, that, that was said was, don't try and understand, just believe. Well, that's the thing. Faith is, that's what faith is. It's the ability to believe in the things that aren't seen. Does the simple fact of believing in something that you can't see make you a suitable case for treatment? Or should we base our beliefs only on what can be proved to be true? Someone like me, who is pretty damn sure that religion is not true, does need to ask why people believe it. Well, one explanation could be that they're just making an honest mistake, and it's not mentally ill to make an honest mistake. It's not always mentally ill to think you've seen something when you haven't. It's not mentally ill to succumb to peer group pressures. Everybody in your church believes, so you believe. But you do meet religious people, and I have met religious people, in whom the fervour, something in their eyes, something in the quiver of their voice, suggests to me either that they've seen God or that they're unbalanced. And uh, I incline to the second explanation. I don't think the excitement in Hillsong is any kind of evidence of mental disorder. The people here are clearly finding meaning and contentment from their beliefs and behaviours and causing no harm. The Pentecostals are the fastest growing church in Christianity. Their 500 million followers, mostly from Africa, Asia and Latin America, believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, God and the devil, heaven and hell. Many also believe in what they call speaking in tongues. Is this a sign of God or a sign of disorder? Psychologist Chris French has studied religious phenomena like speaking in tongues around the world. What this looks like to, to the outside observer is suddenly people start babbling, essentially. Um, the idea of speaking in tongues is that this is some kind of manifestation of, of the Holy Spirit, typically within Christian religious groups. And the idea is that these messages that are coming through will actually need to be interpreted by someone who has the gift of interpretation and they can tell you what the what the message from God is all about. Now when these kind of utterances have been subjected to analysis by linguists it's clear that in fact they are pure gibberish. There is no proper linguistic structure there at all. <laughs> But while some psychologists dismiss speaking in tongues as gibberish, evangelical Christians believe this is a spontaneous and divine manifestation of the Holy Spirit, expressing the voice of God through a human vessel. I would say there's no evidence there that there's anything divine going on. What the evidence does suggest is that you've actually got a kind of learned behaviour to some extent. Um, people in these kind of congregations have lots and lots of opportunity and encouragement to actually model this kind of behavior. They see other people performing in this way, 
This is taken as evidence of some kind of, of blessing. Very often it's seen as being a kind of transition point. The first time you speak in tongues is the time when you get rid of your old sinful life and take on this new virtuous life. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots and lots of reinforcement for doing that. But what happens when rational belief is confronted with pure faith? America is one of the most scientifically advanced and also one of the most religious societies on Earth. I've come here to find out what science can tell us about faith when it comes to speaking in tongues. <laughs> Reverend Jerry Stolfus is a fundamentalist Christian who believes the Holy Spirit can speak through him. Within moments of speaking in tongues, he seems normal again. So what has just happened? I think it is my spirit talking. And so, when I pray in tongues, I am believing that the Holy Spirit is interpreting for me what I don't know how to say or don't even know what I should say. Because words God. themselves are inadequate in that words moment. Words are inadequate. They, and the whole human uh, body of wisdom and knowledge is inadequate to explain or describe what a person is feeling. That's why we're still trying. So my understanding would be uh, and this comes from Romans 8.26. It says that the Holy Spirit makes interpretation for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And it's talking there about those um, pre-verbal times when there is no way to express what you're feeling. So in a sense, it's, it's a very primitive, regressed emotional state, is what you're hmm. saying. Am I hearing you correctly? I don't think so at all. No. No, I don't think you're hearing me correctly at all. Help me, help me. I think understand. it is I think it is a an admission that there are some things language doesn't touch and therefore looking for some other way to work at that expression. There's no evidence that there really is any message there. Now what that means is that then whoever is doing the interpreting can make anything of that message that they want to. And typically the way it's interpreted is in terms of the particular version of the religion that's being preached in that particular congregation. Mm. So all of that would suggest that although it may look to the, those who believe that this is some kind of evidence of being touched by God, in actual fact, I, I'd say the evidence very strongly suggests it isn't. So is this all just a figment of Jerry's imagination or is there actually something physical going on in his brain which would enable him to speak with the voice of God? Normally, scientists shy away from any exploration of religious phenomena for fear of their colleagues' ridicule. Neurotheologian Dr. Andrew Newberg is trying to bridge the gap between the rational and the faithful. We've been studying a large number of different religious and spiritual practices and experiences using different types of brain imaging. The whole purpose is to see the variety of changes that go on within the person when they are engaged in different kinds of practices and especially when we see kind of the broad variety of experiences that people have that they consider to be religious or spiritual we're trying to tap into that and try to understand how those experiences really affect a person and how they affect them not just subjectively but objectively as well by studying their biological responses. Today Dr. Newberg is researching what really happens inside the brain of someone speaking in tongues. He first injects a radioactive trace into Jerry's bloodstream and then asks the pastor to speak in tongues. The radioactive tracer records brain activity which can then be tracked in a scanner. Explain to me what is going on inside Jerry's brain. Um, what we're seeing on this slice here, these are slices through the brain, uh, as if we could just kind of made a cut here and pop the top of the head off and you're looking down on the scan. And the way to look at this is that the areas that have the brightest amount of yellow 
uh, are considered to be the most active, and this is a measure of blood flow. The idea about how the brain works in general is that the more active a particular part is, the more blood flow it gets, the less active, the less blood flow it gets. And what we have found in, in our people speaking in tongues is a drop of activity in this frontal lobe, that part of the brain that would normally make them feel like they were in charge of what was happening to them. So I think that this at least supports the experience that they have, that whatever is coming out of them is not what they are in charge of. Does this prove that he isn't making this up, that this is a real experience he's happening? Well, it proves that neurologically there's something that's really happening that is associated with the kinds of experiences that he has. Now, if you're asking, is it a real experience, meaning that when he says, this feels like the Spirit of God moving through him, I don't think this scan disproves it, I don't think it proves it. All it is showing is that when he has that feeling that God is actually speaking through him, that the parts of the brain that are his normal language areas are not being turned on. Right. So it's not, it's not him faking it, at least in the sense that he's not purposefully trying to produce this sound. Uh, so in that sense, it's not faking it. Dr. Newberg's research to date does appear to show that there is something going on in the brain of believers that is not the product of deliberate decision-making. But that's a long way from saying this is proof that God is responsible. So are you the scientist who's going to prove the existence of God? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a pre I don't have a previously arranged agenda as to whether I'm trying to disprove or prove God. I'd love to be able to do one or the other, um, but um, I, it, for me, I think that because we know so little about how we as human beings experience reality uh, and understand that reality, and because we exist in this infinite universe or almost um, that. I think it's very difficult for anybody to ultimately be able to do that, uh, to say one way or another, just because everything that we think and feel and believe about the world is processed by the human brain. Unless we can find some way of essentially escaping that brain to see what is actually out there in the world, um, we may never get to that, inf to, to, to that knowledge. Dr. Newberg believes that Jerry is not just pretending to be able to speak in tongues. Whatever is actually happening, his brain is registering a real event of some kind. But how far can this go? Can simple faith overturn the laws of science? Can miracles happen? I want you to give the Lord the biggest shout of hallelujah. Come on. Benny Hinn is one of the world's most popular and charismatic preachers. He reaches an audience of tens of millions in over 190 countries, and his church receives over $100 million in donations and by selling DVDs like this one each year. He too claims that God speaks directly to him. At this rally in India in 2004, he drew a crowd of one and a half million. During the performance, the crowd became aroused by the sophisticated light show, the music, the excitement, and the offer of simple but miraculous solutions for all of life's problems. That was impeccably choreographed. The music suddenly oh, came yes. in as well. Very, very slick, the whole operation. Clearly, he's a showman. He's a massive, he knows, he's a huge show. I mean, yeah. this is a rock concert. This is, I mean, now the child is crying. He's completely overwhelmed. Why are you crying, baby? It Why may be crying? mere showmanship, but does it do any harm? Well, it depends how far you go with the idea that God is reaching out to touch you. Well, I mean, basically, faith healing goes back to ancient times. There have always been people around who claimed that they could perform these miracle cures. I mean, the best example, of course, would be Jesus in the Bible. But these people have always been around, and healing has always been taken as some kind of indication of being touched by the power of God and presented as evidence for the existence of God and that if you have enough faith, then you can be healed. Thanks. Oh, that's glory. Why did she just fall over? That apparently is called being slain in the spirit. So it's meant to be a kind of power of the Holy Ghost. Okay. It's going to fall backwards. Child. Child. Well, come on, give the Lord a mighty hand. Come on. Part of the message is about just believing in God and having faith in God and the idea that when we die, that's not the end. 
there is an afterlife. Now that is a, something we all desperately want to believe. The evidence doesn't have to be that good to convince us because we want to believe it anyway. Pastor, he has a steel rod in his neck. He was going to have to wear that contraption for the rest of his life. But yesterday, God began to work the miracle. No independent medical evidence is ever presented to back up the claims of miracle cures. Depending on your beliefs, the sick and disabled brought out on stage are either swept up in the moment or genuinely being touched touched by God. To my mouth. Yeah. Up. Up. Nothing. What you think? I suspect Nothing. that's not really a very good thing to do if you don't know what his medical condition is. What we'll see time and time again is there's no proper follow-up on any of these cases. These people have the excitement of the evening, they have these miracles, alleged miracles, paraded out in front of them, but there's no follow-up. Nobody goes back six months later to say, has that cancer really gone? Have you really been cured of this? Benny Hinn refused to take part in this program and he has also consistently failed to provide any valid scientific evidence to prove that any of the faithful are genuinely healed at his services. You deserve the glory. If you, if you believe that you, know, you have a particular religious worldview and it helps you to make sense of the universe and gives your life meaning, fine. Mm. There's no, I, I can't kind of argue, I don't happen to agree, but I'm not going to take issue with that. If you're making claims that this has real effects in the real world on real people, mm -hmm. then, okay, show me the evidence, convince me. And the evidence just isn't there in the case of miracle healing. The young man had a tumor in his back, and tonight, when you called out somebody being healed, the tumor disappeared in his back. So maybe this is where I demonstrate my own prejudice. While I strongly support the idea of a relationship between the brain and the body, mind over matter, the sight of sick people putting themselves into the hands of someone like Benny Hinn confirms for me how desperate people can be attracted to irrational solutions based on blind faith. But of course it's not just the simple, the desperate and the gullible who subscribe to belief in a world beyond provable fact. My friend and fellow broadcaster Jeremy Vine lives and works in a society where there is a broad consensus that science, not the supernatural, rules. But Jeremy is a man of faith. It's, very, it's difficult to be a Christian in a post-religious world because um, anything that looks like certainty is immediately doubted. But when you say that anything to do with certainty is now doubted, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I, when I was initially a Christian, when I was about 21, I had a totally gung-ho approach to my faith. I thought, I felt totally certain. And I thought that, that certainty and faith are the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that anyone who was doubtful was ignorant. So I, certainty and faith are the same, ignorance and doubt are the same. Now I've switched around completely. I now think that, that certainty and ignorance are the same thing. The people who look the most certain probably know the least. The closest I've ever felt I've come to knowledge has been actually in prayer, where I felt that I'm not the only person in this conversation. I am praying to something and there's something there. Right. Really, I, I think that, that there is a God. I, I think Christ was who he said he was, you know. Um, maybe that makes me totally mad, but that's what I think. If, if your, your position, let's say, for the sake of argument, is God is not there, and my position is that God is there, I don't see that any one of us has any greater amount of evidence than the other. So I think in the end, probably, there's a lot of conditioning that comes into it. You think what you think because you're, you know, you're a certain type of person. I think what I think because, well, what is it, my parenting or my upbringing? Coming from a background in science, you set up your hypotheses and you, and you start from a, from a position of not knowing or only knowing what you can prove. And because it's, it cannot be proved, therefore, the position that I'm standing in, I'm taking with you, at the moment, has the greater weight. Yeah. Scientists uh, uh, prove wrong so often. Absolutely. And, and it's, when they are, it's embarrassing. But if one, of your, if one of your children was ill, who would you go to? The doctor or the church? The doctor. So, at the end of the day... The church would be the last resort. I think it would have to be the doctor initially. <laughs> of course it would be the doctor. What am I saying? I'd be arrested if I didn't take her to the doctor. Sure. But why do I say that with such conviction? I don't know. I mean, um, maybe I'm concerned that, you know, I'm not ever sure that, I, that so how maybe... much healing goes on, you know, and, right. 
is healing a part of faith? Does it happen? Is it, if you believe, do you get healed? I'm not sure. If a person is made to feel better, happier, because they're convinced they've had a spiritual experience, does it really matter if there's no scientific proof of how it works? Surely what matters is that their health and happiness are restored. Psychologists use cognitive behaviour therapy, or CBT, to enable unhappy people to replace negative views with positive beliefs, and then help them to devise mental strategies to cope with their pain. But this sometimes means listening to beliefs that run counter to everything our scientific training has taught us. That's it, going deep, deep. So what are we to make of this? The woman with her back to the camera has a history of psychiatric problems. The man who is putting her into a trance is a consultant psychiatrist who used to work in the National Health Service. Please put. Dr. Alan Sanderson has now turned away from the conventions of psychiatry and embraced what to non-believers may seem ridiculous supernatural rubbish. He calls it spirit release. Tell me your name. Sarah. So tell me, Sarah, how old are you? Now, I think I'm about eight or nine. You're eight or nine? Yes. Dr. Sanderson now believes he can relieve mental distress in his patients by bringing out the spirits of the dead trapped inside them. You're here in the body of somebody who's a grown woman. Do you understand that, Sarah? Not really. Not really, no. Tell me, Sarah, what happened to your physical body? I just stopped breathing. Sarah, you've lost that body now. Um, spirits sometimes think that the body belongs to them. So are spirits like parasites then, in a way? Sort of living and feeding off the person that they are, yeah. are with? Yes, you could, you could call them parasites. Right. They're not all spirits are parasites by any means. Um, it seems that many people have uh, spirits of a higher order who are there as their guides, spirits who have been alive in their bodies but have reached the point where they can be a guide to somebody. Sarah, you've lost that body now. You've lost that body. You're talking to me through a body which doesn't belong to you. But your soul is here. That's how you're able to speak to me. Belief in possession by spirits flies in the face of everything I believe as a psychologist. So it's challenging, to say the least, to see another mental health professional who is encouraging his patients to believe that their problems can be solved by his casting out spirits. But these human spirits that you would communicate with in the session, these are the spirits of people who have died? Yeah, not, uh, not necessarily. Uh, so it could be... Uh, spirit of someone who's alive. Because in the spiritual dimension we can be in more, more places than one at a time. So part of my spirit could actually be in somebody else while yeah. I'm alive. That's right. And Sarah, I'd like to help you to move on, to go to heaven. You can do that. Well, I think we'll ask your mum and dad to come for you. That would be good. Mm. If you just look round and think strongly of your mum and dad, mm. I think you'll find that they're here. Well, you then talk to the spirit. You see them now. And you need to find out why the spirit is there. And uh, you have to negotiate with the spirit. You find out, why, find out, first of all, you say to the spirit, did you ever have a, a human physical body of your own? Right. And usually they'll say yes. Occasionally, they just don't know. Occasionally they're confused. Spirits can be very confused. Mm -hmm. uh, most of these spirits have died a sudden, a violent death. Mm -hmm. Because that's disorienting in itself. Ask her, Mummy, have you come to take me? To heaven? I can't hear her. You can't? Yes. She says yes. Look at her face. Tell yes. me. She's she happy to see you? Yes. She's really happy to see you, isn't she? Yes. I'll ask her another question. There's another question. Mummy, have you come from the light? Yes. I'll ask her again. Yes. Are you from the light, Mummy? Yes. And ask her once more. Are you really from the light? In his 40-minute session with his patient, Dr. Sanderson believed he released the spirits of a young girl and her abusers from centuries earlier. Ask your mummy, where is the light? Where is the light? Show me where the light is. It's behind her. It's behind her. Do you actually do you believe that you are releasing a spirit? 
I believe that I'm actually that spirits actually being released. I was about to say I'm releasing spirits. Well, I'm not. Uh, one yeah. releases. Um, there's a lot of unseen help, yeah. but I'm helping the release of spirits. Of course, uh, there are times when you've got to take care that you're not leading your your patient, suggesting things to them, and I'm very careful not to do that. Is there anything that you want to say before you go? You're ready to go now, aren't you? Good. All right. Will you go with your mum and uh, you go with our love and blessing. Dr Sanderson sincerely believes he's helping his patients, though he accepts that as yet there is no independent clinical evidence that spirit release is safe or effective in treating people with psychiatric problems. Do you think one day, maybe who knows how in how many years, do you think spirit release therapy will be more part of the mainstream? of the therapies available to people with mental health difficulties? I believe it will. Um, We know from research on uh, asking patients about their spiritual beliefs and their spiritual and their wishes that uh, those who have a strong belief in a spiritual worldview do much better when they're in a psychiatric institution or mental health uh, some sort of mental health unit, they do much better than the ones who don't have this belief. Mm. All right, is it just a matter of belief? I think they are sustained by a belief and by a worldview which makes sense. There's no way of knowing whether spirit release is practised by... When you hear Sunita say that she needed to lose her mind and have her brain washed, you can understand why Simon Cowell was worried. But Sunita's decision to remake herself as a child of God has undoubtedly brought her happiness. Modern secular society, however, is uncomfortable with behaviour based not on hard fact, but blind faith. What was interesting, though, in the sermon that we were listening to earlier is one of the things that that, that was said was, don't try and understand, just believe. I don't think the excitement in Hillsong is any kind of evidence of mental disorder. The people here are clearly finding meaning and contentment from their beliefs and behaviours and causing no harm. The Pentecostals are the fastest growing church in Christianity. Their 500 million followers, mostly from Africa, Asia and Latin America, believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible, God and the devil, heaven and hell. Many also... ...mistake. It's not always mentally ill to think you've seen something when you haven't. It's not mentally ill to succumb to peer group pressures. Everybody in your church believes, so you believe. But you do meet religious people, and I have met religious people, in whom the fervour, something in their eyes, something in the quiver of their voice, suggests to me either that they've seen God or that they're unbalanced, and uh, I incline to the second explanation. Well, that's the thing, faith, is that's what faith is. It's the ability to believe in the things that aren't seen. Does the simple fact of believing in something that you can't see make you a suitable case for treatment, or should we base our beliefs only on what can be proved to be true? Someone like me, who is pretty damn sure that religion is not true, does need to ask why people believe it. Well, one explanation could be that they're just making an honest mistake, and it's not mentally ill to make an honest mistake. Look, it's Bible-based, it's just that it's modern, and it's in English we understand, and no, we don't have incense and communion, but it's, it's, it's you know, just Christianity. There is a belief that, that someone who suddenly becomes very religious is having some kind of mental breakdown. Yeah, I think so, and the thing is, I just suddenly realised everything is like smoke and mirrors, everything's back to front. And I think I did lose my mind, but I was losing an unhealthy mind and gaining a good one. And I was having my brain thoroughly washed because I suddenly could see things in the correct perspective.